Right here in this toroid, we have enough energy to transform the entire Earth. And that's not just a theoretical statement, it's literally true. To contemplate the implications of this means that every single place on Earth suddenly has power. Every single person on Earth suddenly has power. We have universal abundance. From decades of research, I've concluded that the torus is, in fact, the fundamental pattern that the universe uses. My explorations with many scientists through the Sequoia Symposium, the University of Science and Philosophy, the Institute for the Study of Consciousness, and other venues has given me strong confirmation for these insights into primary patterning. I worked with physicist, geometer, computer scientist Robert Gray to see if what we had learned would reveal a useful new understanding of the table of atomic elements, the 92 complex patterns by which spirit or consciousness manifests into what we call matter. Bucky Fuller's cosmic octave hierarchy laid out a potentially predictable series of shapes with each electron as a torus on the outside and each proton as a torus in the nucleus, both connected by a tornado-like vortex of energy. Confirmation of our identifying this atomic structure came along the way from the work of Patrick Flanagan. The donuts were spinning in, in such a way that energy was exiting at the equator and energy was coming in through the poles. And the proton had the exact reverse. So now a neutron would be a combination of an electron and a proton coupled together. The cosmic octave hierarchy is to 3D geometry what the music octave is to sound waves or the rainbow is to light. It begins with the simplest space containing form, the tetrahedron, and its dual. These two form the cube whose dual is the octahedron. Next comes the icosahedron and its partner, the dodecahedron. And finally, the vector equilibrium and its dual, the rhombic dodecahedron. As with so much in nature, the sequence seems to follow the most efficient, least effort arrangements of symmetry in space. Increasing external pressure creates not billiard balls, but more and more of the whirlpools that show up as electrons on the outside and protons on the inside. As the structure of the atoms become more complex and get heavier, they periodically reach stability in what are called the inert or noble elements, neon, then argon, then krypton, xenon, and finally radon. Each of these is characterized by having eight electrons in the outer shell. And I believe these eight vortices match the eight outer triangles of the vector equilibrium. And that is why they exhibit equilibrium on their own. They are essentially satisfied or literally fulfilled and do not seek to combine with other atoms for stability. As each so-called shell builds toward equilibrium, the pressure creates more and more vortices inside the outer shell, and these form the geometries of the octave hierarchy. The atomic numbers of each inner shell hint that if we could look inside, we could see the sequential forming of the duotetrahedron, the octahedron, the icosahedron, and the dodecahedron. The late master geometer Marvin Solid showed me how nature's phi spiral coordinates even atomic structure. And more recently, cosmometry explorer Marshall Lefferts has been modeling this dynamic. The final elements, like radon and uranium, have their outer vortices or electrons so far from the pull of the nucleus that they are on the verge of flying off to join other atoms. That seems to explain why they're so volatile and ready to radiate or start a chain reaction. Physicists have been spending billions in taxpayer money for decades trying unsuccessfully to access energy through attempting to fuse hydrogen atoms together at sun-like temperatures in their tokamak device. They're using the torus shape, 
but still use an approach of force rather than blending or resonance. At the new Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, they have constructed the largest ever man-made torus, 17 miles around, to reach energy levels that they hope would reveal the substructure of the atom and to find the Higgs boson that is supposed to make the whole universe work. The fundamental idea is crashing protons together at high speed to create a powerful splash of energy. What if instead we were to take a more Aikido-type blending approach, to learn to follow the dance, to see what the universal energy flow naturally does, and then go with it instead of crashing against it? What if the fundamental building block of the universe is not a thing, a billiard ball-type particle, but a geometry of flow, a pattern that holds true at any scale? What if instead of creating more violence to access our energy needs, we look to harmonic resonance, to the natural amplification that happens when waves are in sync, when two systems get in tune? Here we are at one of the world's oldest sacred sites, the Osirian Temple at Abydos, Egypt. Very little writing is found in the Zion Temple. However, there is one very significant piece of information in that temple. It is a very faint but clear and precise drawing. It's not etched into the rock, it's not carved, it's burnt into the atomic structure of the rock in some extraordinary way. Nassim has decoded the Osirian symbol in three dimensions. Since our world is not two-dimensional, it makes sense that codes relaying information about our world also wouldn't be limited to flat designs. His three-dimensional version of the Osirian symbol starts with the vector equilibrium, a perfectly balanced force field with 12 equal energy lines radiating out. They stabilize its center like the 12 spokes of a wheel. The primary pattern of balanced energy flow around this structure is the torus. Here we expand to the next larger scale with a total of 64 pyramids called tetrahedra. If we then put spheres in, representing the toroidal energy field surrounding each of the pyramids, and then we drop away the pyramids, we end up with a matrix that is, amazingly, an exact overlay for the Osirian icon, a three-dimensional model of the same pattern that was burned into the rock wall of the Egyptian temple thousands of years ago. The appearance throughout the world of so-called crop circles. These elaborate designs appear mysteriously swirled into crops of grain in such a way that the stalks are bent over, yet remain alive. More than 5,000 of these patterns have appeared in over 30 countries, most of them in England. The media has led many people, including me at first, to write these crop patterns off as hoaxes, the nighttime work of a few pranksters. Of course, there have been faked versions, but those made by human hands are crude compared to the vast majority of these elegant creations. Could hoaxers have created all 5,000 of these patterns? Could a few people with ropes and boards have created something as complex and beautiful as this one? made in the dead of night in a driving rain and leaving no footprints in the soil? The electromagnetic field over the area where the crop's been laid down to create the image is often electrostatically charged. Some of these areas are littered with strange magnetic particles. Year after year, these spectacular creations appear.
So what might these remarkable designs mean? Here are some two-dimensional versions that seem to be revealing the Taurus in 3D. Here is the vector equilibrium. And the related pattern of 64 that we saw encoded in the arts of so many ancient cultures. When I saw the coherence between the crop circles and the ancient encodings, I thought regardless of whoever created them and wherever they're from, there must be an important purpose to these designs. They're so coherent. I've come to believe that the pattern of the torus and the vector equilibrium, especially in the form of the 64 tetrahedron crystal, is showing us how energy works in the universe so that we can learn to align with it. Right here in this toroid, we have enough energy to transform the entire Earth. Every single place on Earth suddenly has power.
single place on earth suddenly has power. Every single person on earth suddenly has power. We have universal abundance. And that's not just a theoretical statement, it's literally true. Caught in the crossfire. <laughs> Caught in the crossfire